So back in part one of this video series, I complained about the vast number of villains introduced in season one of Young Justice. Many people felt that this criticism was a bit of a nitpick, or just found it perplexing. Fortunately, episode 14 provides me with another chance to explain what I see as the problem with that, as I don't think I did the best job of articulating my feelings last time. Because those of you saying that there's no inherent problem with having more villains are absolutely correct. The problem I should have focused on is that having so many villains means that less time is spent on main villains introduced in the series. Basically, I would have preferred a smaller number of villains, with each villain being more well explored. After all, there are a large number of reoccurring, important villains in the series, but I feel that many of them lack development. The reason why episode 14 provides me with another opportunity to talk about this is because, well, this episode involves the Injustice League, who exist to convince the Justice League that they have taken down the group of villains working together. Of course, in reality, the real group of villains behind so many events in this season are hiding behind these villains, using them as a decoy. This means that seven villains are introduced in this episode. Atomic Skull, Black Adam, Count Vertigo, Poison Ivy, Ultra Human Knight, and Wotan. Now, there is a plot reason why so many villains are being introduced at once, which, of course, is that it simply needs to be believable that this group has been behind so much stuff. As such, the more people involved, the better. However, I think a better balance between believability and information introduction could have been achieved. As far as I'm concerned, having three or four villains would have been enough, and that way, those three or four villains could have been given more time to develop. They could have kept Poison Ivy, since her abilities are so plot relevant, then Count Vertigo could stay since he's going to show up later as the main villain of episode 20, and then Ultra Humanite could have stayed due to his affiliation with the Brain. Obviously, you might disagree with these picks, but my main point is that having less villains would have resulted in a more thorough exploration of the villains here. However, regardless of my complaints, this episode works well as far as Young Justice's overarching plot is concerned. After all, here the team is given more trust and they perform well. It's the natural evolution of their team dynamic, and one that the show has been slowly building up episode by episode. It also allows for plot elements that are going to return in important ways to come up again, such as the Helmet of Fate. Still, I think more time should have been spent here. Though it is functional, it's far from ideal. If this episode was instead two parts long, that would afford more time for some deeper development for our main cast. While some of the upcoming episodes are going to have significant developments for the cast, many of those developments are going to focus on the character's weaknesses, or on the team seeming to break apart. So the stronger they seem here, the better, and the more time that would allow for the team to work through obstacles together, debating different strategies, each of them using their unique skills to help the team out and ultimately come to victory. Sure, that's still there, but it all just kind of flies by. Basically, the higher heights the team achieves here, the further their fall will be as well, which may resonate with audiences even more, and I would have liked to see the team reach even higher heights. Fortunately, I prefer episode 15. In this one, the team searches for Red Tornado, and the events in this episode basically serve as a continuation of episode 12, when the group's home base was invaded. It also serves as the introduction of Zatanna, who from now on is going to be a fairly major character in this season. Overall, this episode thematically focuses on the question of what it means to be human, as Tio Moro recounts how he created both Red Torpedo and Red Inferno as robots who would believe that they are human, and we thus see more of Red Tornado's own struggles with his conception of humanity. He longs to be human, and at the end of the episode, even goes to see a bedridden Tio Moro because it's the human thing to do, or at least he sees it that way. These conflicts are also related to Superboy's conflict, and though first-time viewers don't know this yet, it's also related to Red Arrow. This connection with Superboy is quite explicit, with Aqualad pointing out the similarities of their situations. Considering Superboy's desire to belong, to be the real Superman, and how that's going to be explored in upcoming episodes, it's a great idea to connect Superboy's struggle with a struggle of performativity. After all, these robots want to perform the role of a human, just as Superboy wants to perform the role of Superman. He wants to be what he sees as the real deal, just as Red Tornado wants to be that. However, their struggles also create an interesting conflict, where Superboy has to accept some of the potential limitations of his human parts, as he isn't able to use all of Superman's Kryptonian powers. Overall, this episode just does a wonderful job as far as connecting with Superboy's later struggles is concerned. Plus, it provides quite a lot of character development for Red Tornado himself, and considering how frequently he shows up and how important he is to the team, it's a good thing to feel more connected to him. Plus, this episode shows the team looking like, well, a team. But not just a team. A team of friends. 
While they've definitely gotten along fairly well in the past, there's also been a good amount of them being dysfunctional. Here, however, they not only work together, but they also have great chemistry. For example, there's this moment where Robin says that he's going to need a dumb idea if they're going to find Tio Morrow, and they all turn to Kid Flash and he just says, as a matter of fact. Having characters poke fun at each other while getting along is a good way of showing that characters are very close. After all, I might make a joke like this with some close friends, but I'm not likely to do that with someone I don't know very well. So in a way, the show is doing what I thought would be good in episode 14. It's building the team up before tearing them down. It's just doing that at a different time and in a bit of a different way than they could have with episode 14, with the team here growing closer not just by working together, but also by getting their teacher back. And now it crashes down. Episode 16. A lot of people call this episode a favorite. But my first time watching this? Honestly, I really wasn't a fan. Of course, with how so many characters are dying, it's pretty clear that there's going to be some twist at the end that brings them back, so I just spent the whole episode waiting for it. Twists like that are one of my pet peeves with fiction, and really distract me from anything else that could be good within the episode or part of the story that that happens in. As soon as I think that it's possible that someone might just wake up and it will all be over, everything will get reset, I start to check out. Which is why I'm very happy that I went back and watched this one again. Because the second time, I just accepted it for what it was, and I tried to set aside my feelings about the waking up type trope. And this is a good episode, as well as an episode that has plenty of good reasons to use that typical plot point. After all, in this episode, the characters become convinced that what is effectively a simulation is actually reality, because Miss Martian subconsciously uses her powers to make everyone in the simulation think everything that happens there is real. Since the simulation was created so that everyone would fail no matter what they did, this, of course, has some pretty disastrous consequences. And since the characters don't know that this is a simulation, having the audience not know that is a good way of helping them connect with the characters. After all, if there's even a chance that an audience member thinks there might be any reality to this situation, then they're more likely to understand the impact this has on the characters. Of course, the creators could have opted to just let the audience in on the secret at the beginning of the episode. We could have seen them all getting ready for the simulation. While my preference would have been for that, this relatability aspect makes the fact that they went this route pretty easy for me to understand. And I also understand why many people might prefer the approach the creators chose to the approach I would take. Beyond all that, the snow wind scenario allows us to see the characters in unique situations that we simply could not otherwise see them in. For many of the characters, this reveals a weakness within them, or at least something that they don't like about themselves or don't want to face. First, Aqualad makes the decision to sacrifice himself, even though, as a leader, that's a horrible decision to make. After all, he needs to be there to guide his team. Second, this sparks a lot of worry in Miss Martian's mind about her own powers. Having Miss Martian worry about them is a good idea, as that internal conflict is going to drive many of her actions, especially in Season 2, even if other conflicts also drive those actions. Third, we get to see Superboy being treated like Superman, which, as we will see in the next episode, reveals the dark side of him that is willing to feel glad even when so many bad things happen, just as long as he can be like Superman. Fourth, Kid Flash's reaction to Artemis' death serves as another way that the show makes the relationship seem more natural, and forces him to confront the fact that he might feel more for her than he lets on. We also see how Kid Flash has a lot of difficulty accepting when something has already been lost, and will continue to try and convince himself that there's a way out or some answer, even when there clearly isn't any. Fifth, Robin is forced to remove himself from the situation, and to make the most logical decisions regardless of the impact it will have on him or his friends. This prompts him to look at himself and see what he can be, or at least what he wants to be, as we'll be focused on in the next episode. Because of the nature of this episode, because of how it shows weaknesses in so many of the characters and ends with many of them being traumatized, a lot of how great it is depends on what episodes do with that. In other words, how much do later episodes capitalize on the characters' realizations about themselves? If it doesn't do much, then this is a neat episode, but not one that will have a satisfying arc in the long run. However, if the show does follow up well, then this becomes a fantastic turning point in the series. Right away, episode 17 dives into the effects this trauma has, with most of the focus being placed on Superboy's feelings. 
The episode has a simple but effective structure, where we jump between Superboy's main plot of the episode and the subplot of all the other members of the team having therapy sessions with Black Canary. Let's start by discussing the characters other than Superboy. Each of these sections is a natural extension of what the characters did in the previous episode. Since Artemis died in the simulation, she claims to be fine, so Black Canary pushes a bit further, asking her about her secrets with her family and about her worries over what Kid Flash would think about that, and just kind of poking her and trying to get to the fact that she is so closed off from these other people, even if she does seem to trust them. Aqualad, meanwhile, feels guilty about sacrificing himself, and discusses how he feels that Robin would be a better leader than him. However, he also expresses that he does not want to shift that burden over to him just yet. Kid Flash, meanwhile, is a lot more nonchalant with his therapy, and Black Canary uses this opportunity to question his extreme reaction to Artemis' death. Robin, on the other hand, has had a huge realization that he doesn't want to be like Batman. He doesn't think that he can do what Batman does, and put his emotions to the side and lead in that manner. Then there's Miss Martian, with her fears of how strong her powers are and the harm they can cause others along with this moment that she's afraid she's turned into a white Martian. Of course, all of these scenes show us something about the characters and make them more complex than they previously were. However, in some ways, Superboy's plot runs counter to this, and in ways that accentuate the therapy session's meanings. There are little character moments, like when Superboy almost introduces himself as Connor, but then chooses Superboy instead, showing how he feels guilty about his contentment in the simulation and doesn't want to use the name Miss Martian gave him. Or at least, that's how I see it. On a larger scale though, this episode involves Superboy being confronted with the Forever People, with a group of people who are so in unison that they can combine into one being. Of course, this stands in stark contrast to Superboy's relationship with his own team in this moment, where he's purposefully separated himself from them and he's feeling something very different than what they feel. However, he sees that even this close team can be manipulated by a strong enough force, and Superboy proves his ability to work as part of a team by helping them, along with Sphere. And his relationship with Sphere is important here too. After all, since he's clearly bonded with her, the Forever People let him keep her. In this way, despite feeling so emotionally distant, it becomes clear to both the audience and Superboy that he can still care, even if his feelings are a bit strange to him. All of this prompts Superboy to come a little closer to his own team and to open up to Black Canary. As such, at the end of the episode, Superboy confesses that despite all the horrible things that happened in the simulation, he was glad that he could be Superman. Of course, he feels guilty about that, but it still doesn't change how he felt and how he feels. And that reveals just how much he wants to be that, how much he wants to be Superman. The fact that all of the other characters' reactions are to some degree in line with one another's makes this even more powerful. It's no wonder that he would feel separated from them and that he would feel guilty. I really like how these sections set up the big conflicts that are going to be covered in the coming episodes. In particular, we really see which elements of these characters are going to cause problems for the team, with many of their discussions here having payoff in the following episodes. After all, episode 21 is going to focus on Miss Martian's self-image problems and her powers. Episode 22 is going to hone in on Superboy's relationship with Lex Luthor and, by extension, Superman. And episode 23 is going to focus on Artemis' distrust in her friends and on Kid Flash's trust in her. All in all, this is a great episode that helps shift the story in a new direction, and that provides a thorough exploration of our central characters, without needing to take a ton of time to do so. Unfortunately, I don't think episode 18 follows this up in the best way. In this one, Artemis is upset when she learns that Superboy and Miss Martian are in a relationship, so she goes out with Zatanna to fight some criminals and blow off some steam. But when they encounter Harm, a psychotic man who's gained the powers of the Sword of Beowulf, things get a bit more complicated and dangerous than they originally imagined. Now, this episode does involve exploring a bit of Artemis' distance from the rest of the group, and by having it be that Harm killed his own sister, it also touches on themes of family that are really relevant to Artemis. However, I would have preferred if this episode's main plot had more relevance to the overall plot of the season. As it stands, we don't really see anything here that we aren't going to see elsewhere, namely in episode 23, and I think that Artemis' struggles are articulated in a far more effective way in that episode. At this point, we're gearing up towards the end, towards the big reveal of what the villains have been planning all along. Taking a detour from that isn't necessarily bad, but it better be a really interesting detour, and this just doesn't do it for me. The interesting parts of it have already been explored in other parts of the show, such as Superboy being surrounded by superhero culture and Artemis' family problems and her secret. So this just feels like a rehash of ideas, and even though that rehash isn't bad, 
it's far from necessary. Because of that, I just don't have much to say about this one. In my opinion, episode 19 is a far better episode, and one reason I like it better is that it manages to connect with the events of episodes 16 and 17. See, the main plot of this episode involves Clarion splitting the world into two separate worlds, with all the people over 18 in one world and all the people under 18 in another. From the adolescent hero's perspectives, and from ours as a viewer at first, the adult heroes have disappeared in a manner that isn't all that different from how they were zapped away in episode 16. The adolescent heroes could easily, and reasonably, panic and hone in on this fact, but instead they remain calm and try to get the situation under control. In this way, their strength as a group is emphasized, and we see how they still manage to work together despite their weaknesses. It highlights their great abilities, even if their individual problems are going to stand in the way of their ability to work together properly in upcoming episodes. Beyond that, I love how this episode uses Captain Marvel's powers. And I just want to clarify that he is called Captain Marvel in the show, since a lot of people seem to know him only by the name Shazam. And yeah, he's also called Shazam, but he is Captain Marvel too. Anyway, regardless of that, this episode allows for Captain Marvel's powers to be used in such a cool way. After all, he's the only one who can travel between the two worlds, the only one who can tell each group of heroes what's going on. However, this steps beyond just being cool and a really neat way of using his powers, and that it also reflects the central idea of this episode. Family is important, and part of that has to do with younger and older people working together. After all, both the adult and adolescent heroes need each other, and Captain Marvel's power embodies that fact in one person. And this leads us to what is likely the most important thing focused on in this episode, Zatanna and Zatara's relationship. Zatanna ends up using the Helmet of Fate to stop Clarion, and once the world comes back together, Zatara makes a deal with Nabu, telling him that, if Nabu lets his daughter go, he'll put on the helmet himself and become Dr. Fate. Since Zatanna just wanted some space at the beginning of the episode, she's gotten what she asked for, but just in a way she never would have really wanted. Overall, the episode uses this fact to focus on the idea that family is precious and, so long as the people in a family care about you and aren't, you know, terrible people, it's good to hold them dear. Of course, this has some obvious connections with Artemis' own relationship with her family and with her struggles that will become particularly relevant in upcoming episodes. So, this episode manages to use Captain Marvel's powers in an interesting way while connecting that application with themes of family and belonging which are also relevant to the series as a whole. So this is some good stuff. My one complaint is that I think more time could have been spent on this. And I think that extra time could have been used to highlight more of how these themes connect with Artemis. On top of that, there could have been some more explicit connections made between episodes 16 and 17. I think some of the connections I pointed out would be stronger if we actually saw some of the adolescent heroes worrying about the fact that the older heroes are gone, if they seem to have more of an awareness of how similar this is to episode 16's events. That way it would be all the more powerful when they did rise above their worries and weaknesses, and it would also serve to help some of these more episodic plots feel integrated into an overall story. Still, regardless of that, this is a good episode in and of itself.